lot of people think of loyalty as a behavior. And I always think of loyalty as an emotion. Um, you know, people talk about loyalty programs, which aren't loyalty programs, they're frequency or bribery programs. So to me, the best brands have this deep emotional connection with consumers. And that's a, because they have a very good, uh, intense focus on who their business model is really built for. They go deep on meeting those customers' needs and wants uh, in a very powerful way that's very different than the next best choice. Today's episode of Staying Curious. I'm your host, Amy Hirschkel, and I'm excited to announce today's guest, Steve Dennis. Steve Dennis has over 30 years of experience as a strategic advisor, board member, general manager, and C level executive at two Fortune 500 retailers. He has worked with dozens of retail, luxury, technology, and social impact brands to inspire, catalyze, and design more remarkable and profitable growth strategies. Steve's signature tell it like it is style and eight essential of remarkable retail framework makes him one of the industry's most in demand thought leaders. He has delivered keynotes, led management workshops and consulted across six continents sharing what it takes to win and keep customers in the age of Amazon, Alibaba and digital disruption. He is also a senior contributor to Forbes magazine, and his insights are regularly featured in the media, including Bloomberg and Business Week, CNBC, CNN, Fortune, Harvard Business Review, Review, USA Today, and the Wall Street Journal, amongst many others. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Thank you, Steve, for joining us today. So honored to speak with you, and I can't wait to get your thoughts from all of your great experience. Um, so let's let's start. Uh, so you in your book you mentioned that um, thirty percent of all retail CEOs fear that uh, their company could be out of business in within thirty six months. I'd love to just kick off this entire podcast with that, you know, very powerful quote. So talk to me a little bit about the current state of sure. the industry in retail. Well, you know, I think. Um... In some cases, big picture, it's kind of scary. Uh, obviously, we've got a tremendous amount of inflation. Consumer seems to be slowing down their rate of spending. There's a number of retail firms that are struggling. So, depending upon where you sit, it can be a pretty, pretty scary, uh, pretty scary place. And I think it's just unclear what 2023 is going to look like. Generally speaking, it looks like it's going to be pretty tough. So in the digital age, is retail dead or traditional well, retail me, dead, I should say? Yeah, I guess. So. What does it mean? What do you mean by traditional retail? Uh, exactly. Brick and mortar retailers that haven't evolved, uh, they're already dead or, or dying. But I think you know, digital did a lot of things. And so it's a little bit hard just to just to boil it down. I suppose the most obvious thing it did, and this really started, you know, more than 25 years ago, you know, it used to be that when we talked about retail, that meant the consumer going someplace, seeing what was on offer, maybe talking to a salesperson, picking out what they wanted, paying for it, hopefully, and taking it home with them. That, you know, in the developed world, that was what 97 to 99% of all retail was. As digital became a thing or e-commerce became a thing, that started to change. Now, more and more products could be sent to us. More and more products could be researched online, even if we ended up buying in a store. And then a whole host of other things started to be layering on top. So that had the effect of creating entirely new business models that weren't anchored in brick and mortar, Amazon being the most obvious, but Etsy and a whole bunch of others that allowed direct to consumer businesses that already existed to suddenly be able to much more efficiently expand their reach. For example, when I was at Neiman Marcus many years ago, we had a pretty significant mail order catalog business, but we only had about 35 stores. Well, with digital, we can now bring our brand to just about anywhere in the country and then eventually anywhere in the world. So you saw a lot of smaller brands, whether they were brick and mortar oriented or mail order catalog oriented, go from, as we did at Neiman Marcus, $100 million to over a billion dollars. And from a consumer standpoint, it just makes it so much easier 
to understand the price of products, what products you might want, whether you're influenced by a search or influenced by influencers. I mean, so there's just so many dynamics of the shopping experience that have changed. If I had to point to one big effect um, that really changed traditional retail is this idea that most of the big successful retailers were all about having a lot of stuff that you go see. That's a very hard business model to make work anymore in an, in an age where there's just so much choice and so much stuff can can be delivered. So, so talk a little bit about that. You know, so the two factors that businesses are struggling with, um, you know, in this race to be both, you know, the the, the leading e-tailer or you know leading retailer um, in, within digital. What are those two factors? You know, because I know that keeping inventory is one of the biggest challenges going on right now. So, so talk about these the, the struggles a little for these businesses. Well, from an inventory standpoint, fail, basically. <laughs> well, Sorry, so there's the strategic issue with inventory, and then there's the more you know kind of tactical COVID one. Um, going back to what I just said earlier, so many business models that were successful of the '70s, '80s, '90s, you know, both the traditional department store, but category killers like Bed Bath and Beyond, Barnes and Noble, uh, and malls more broadly, they were based on being destinations where you could see a lot of stuff, you know, a variety of price points, a variety of styles, et cetera. That was a huge advantage until it wasn't. And it wasn't once uh, digital started to make this pile of inventory, everything for everybody strategy, a weakness. So, so you still have a lot of retailers, not to pick on anybody in particular, but I will, uh, you know, JC Penney, for example, or most malls, you know, where you just got this variety of assortment, most of which is either unnecessary to meet the customer's needs or not differentiated enough for any customers to make a particular effort to go see it or pick it, uh, particularly unless they get a discount. So this idea of kind of serving the peak of the bell curve in a physical store has been a strategy that has been eroding in relevance for 25 years now. So there are a lot of retailers that either are essentially out of business, like like Sears, like Toys R Us, um, or struggling a lot by by staying with this uh, this particular business model. The short term issue with inventory is largely related to COVID and customers not understand or retailers not understanding some of the shifting demand. So there is a bit of a lot of inventory that many retailers are working through right now. But the bigger strategic issue is that uh, many retailers have a model that was built for an age that just doesn't exist anymore. And unless they really blow up that model and radically change the way of doing business, they're not going to be around much longer. Yeah. And are you finding, um, you know, I, I understand you work with with some with these uh, retailers, are you finding there's resistance to that change? You finding that there's fear to the change, or it's more just taking time? Well, it, you know, I hate to give you the it depends answers. You know, there, there's plenty of retailers, including ones that have been around for a while, that are doing just fine and haven't had to evolve their business model all that much. Um, you know, they have been making changes along the way. And they had a, a business model that was pretty well honed. So, you know, that's Best Buy, that's Target, that's uh, Tractor Supply, Nike, Starbucks. You know, they they haven't made, necessarily made radical changes over the last 10 years. They've just had a good business model and have been evolving it. Um, a lot of other retailers are really, I would argue, hamstrung by, in many cases, their physical uh, store presence uh, because they view that they've got to somehow optimize what they already have. So I'll go back to JCPenney, but we could say the same thing about Bed Bath & Beyond, Macy's, a whole bunch of other retailers that have had very poor performance Kohl's over an extended period of time because they are trying to make a broken business model a little bit better. And mm -hmm. that kind of incremental change is not sufficient enough. So it's a, it's a real struggle, I think, and you asked about fear. I mean, I think the answer is, for many of them, they've really got to start from scratch in terms of the way they think about what their business model looks like for the future 
And that starting from scratch process means not only operating in a different way, in some cases with, with different people, different technology, but it means over time blowing up what they already have. And when, you know, my experience working back at Sears in the 90s, even though we had a really good understanding of what we needed to do to change, protecting what we already had was the thing that kept us kept us stuck. And we were afraid to compete with ourselves. We were afraid to start to get away from these very large stores or certain product categories or, um, you know, the real estate that we had. So that is a really vexing, vexing challenge. And if you look at a lot of these retailers, you know, they haven't responded to things that they needed to change, which I would argue have, in many cases have been obvious for, I'll be charitable, 10 years, but I would argue 15 or 20 years. And what is that big, what are you seeing is their thing that they should, is the biggest change? Like what, you know, what is the obvious thing that some of these retailers aren't doing? Well, it's it's not one thing, but I mean, if I had to kind of put a theme to it, is that you have to be willing to change much more dramatically than you think you have to. So for example, mm -hmm. if you're Macy's and you look at what Macy's has been doing, for the last 15 or 20 years, they have been tweaking their product assortment. They've been tweaking their visual uh, elements. They've been experimenting. You know, they added Wetzel's Pretzels and Starbucks, and they've added a few small stores. They bought it added off price. But, but Macy's problem is they don't have enough customers that care enough to shift their spending away from other retailers. Macy's doesn't work over the long term, unless they can dramatically increase um, the rate of customer acquisition and get the customers that already sort of like them to spend a lot more. And incremental changes will not, not do that. Now, what is the exact thing they need to fix? Well, their location is a problem. Most of the market share they've lost, they've lost to off the mall competitors like, like TJ Maxx. So they need to change their format and make it more convenient. They need more differentiation. There's too much product that looks like every other kind of thing. Um, they need to have better service. Uh, you know, So every retailer is going to have a set of things. But the key thing is incremental change. I mean, if you're really irrelevant, if you aren't close to driving the productivity that you need to, then you got to think about it as a step change function, not what I call just a slightly better version of mediocre. And every retailer that has gone out of business or has basically had poor performance over the last five years, you can go in and see, you know, there are two or three things that they need radical change, not incremental change. Um, and that, you know, that's hard for companies to, to pull off. Uh, it requires a really different mindset. And, and in some cases with public companies, it's particularly challenging because most of their investors don't necessarily want to sign up for, for that kind of change and that kind of capital investment. Yeah, it takes a lot of money, funding, and innovation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you talked, you touched a little on it about consumer, um, customer loyalty, um, and that one of, you know, a struggle with the retailer, like, like a Macy's, for example, um, may not be making that a priority, but that companies that do make that a priority are winning, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Um how do you see, like, what success are you seeing with retailers um, that do have that direct one-to-one -one relationships with their end consumers? Like, what does that look like? And how has that been successful as what you've seen? So just to give sort of some examples. Well, one thing, and I'm not trying to be too smart alecky about it, but a lot of people think of loyalty as a behavior. And I always think of loyalty as an emotion. Um, you know, people talk about loyalty programs, which aren't loyalty programs, they're frequency or bribery program. So to me, the best brands have this deep emotional connection with consumers. And that's a, because they have a very good, uh, intense focus on who their business model is really built for. They go deep on meeting those customers' needs and wants uh, in a very powerful way that's very different than the next best choice. And then they create a story that resonates with the consumer and that the consumer is compelled to spread to literally remark upon, which gets to what my book is about. So, you know, in order to do that, you have to really pick, you know, get clear about 
who your business value proposition is for, what it's for, and how you will create the story that they will spread. And then you have to deliver on that consistently. So if you compare that, just go back to Macy's, not to pick on them, you know, what's the story about, you know, who, who's the Macy's customer? What are those set of needs and wants that Macy's meets in a really deep, powerful, highly differentiated way? What's that exciting story that millions and millions of customers are, are spreading? The answer is nothing. There isn't anything. And that explains, uh, is a big reason, not the only reason why, why they struggle. You look at brands like Apple, uh, you know, or even, you know, you could say more mundane brands like Ulta or Starbucks, you know, there is a lot there that connects with customers in a power, powerful way to the point where people identify themselves as a Starbucks customer or a Duncan's customer, right? An Android customer or an Apple customer, right? They're connected to the story of the brand as much as they are connected to sort of the product functionality. Because I think we could all agree that Starbucks probably does not have objectively the best coffee uh, or, you know, I mean, it's not so much about the technical requirements. It's such a great experience. <laughs> right. But it's, Sorry, just, it's part of the whole, it's part of the whole story, right? Like, I mean, I, yeah. in my book, I talk about, uh, cause I've, one of the things I kind of make fun of is uh, having been in retail for a long time and knowing lots of merchants, you know, they always say, it's always about the product. It's always about the product. Product is everything. And I, that's demonstrably nonsense. I'm not saying product is not important, but you know, why does somebody pay $4 at Walgreens for some lotion and somebody else spend $250 for that same face cream at Saks, there is very, very little difference. Uh, this has been scientifically tested between the functionality of those products, just like most people can't tell the difference between a $4 bottle of wine and a $40 bottle of wine, or, you know, my two or $3 bottle of water versus what I could get from 7-Eleven. And so, you know, there may be minor differences in functionality, but the main thing is I'm the sort of person that wears La Mara cream, right? I'm the sort of person that drinks Fiji bottled water. I'm the sort of person that drinks a nice wine. Not that I really believe my skin looks that much better or my, my thirst is quenched. So, so I think it's very, you know, when it comes to loyalty, as opposed to just a functional purpose, you know, it is it is really knowing that sort of customer who's going to resonate with that story and then, you know, pulling all the levers that meet those needs and wants in a powerful way, including emotional needs. So so you touched on your book a little. Talk about um, talk about the book uh, and kind of what got you to write that book. It seems like we've been getting a little bit of a taste of, of what where this came from. But talk a little bit about your journey and how ultimately you wrote the book and, and, and why basically? Sure. Well, there are a few things. One is when I started doing consulting and uh, more speaking, I guess at this point, 12 or 13 years ago, well, one from a speaking standpoint, I had to figure out what the heck I was going to talk about. So I was starting to develop these talks where I was explaining what I thought the key trends were, uh, what to make of them and what to do about them. And over a period of years, a narrative started to come together. And part of that narrative was in some cases uh, dispelling what I thought were were not useful narratives like the retail apocalypse narrative for one, or this idea that as e-commerce grows, it automatically comes at the expense of physical stores. So there was a lot of talk about that. And I saw a lot of I mean, aside from just what was in the media, that wasn't super helpful. I actually saw a lot of companies acting on that knowledge and therefore doing almost 180 degrees the wrong thing. So there was part of me, which is I want to help, um, you know, beyond just you know a few clients that I could have. I want to affect on a broader scale, a better understanding of what was really going on, what was likely to come out of all this and what to do about it. And then as I started to have what I thought was a useful framework, you know, then I felt I had something, something to say that, that perhaps people would benefit from. So, uh, but I also always wanted to write a book. And so this was just <laughs> my, the best thing I could come up with, I guess, at the, the time to write about. So talk about the book. Um, you, you know, you mentioned um, 
some of the some of these main principles. Well, first, why don't we list the, the principles and then we'll talk about two in particular that I felt really um, resonate with this conversation. But talk about the principles of the book. Sure. Well, just to kind of lead up to that, the first, there's two parts to the book. The first part is really kind of how we got here, um, what it all means and kind of where things are going. That really sets the stage. We've, we've talked about a bunch of those, those things already. What I wanted to do in the second part of the book is lay out what I call the eight essentials of remarkable retail. So uh, remarkable being, as I said earlier, this idea of not only being incredibly distinct and differentiated, but really creating such an emotional connection with the customer that the customer will literally talk about it. So very much stolen from my friends, uh, Seth Godin's book, Purple Cow from a number of years ago, but, but brought into the retail context. And then these eight essentials that I laid out, what I found, and, you know, again, retail is such a big, complex industry. It's hard to say, well, you know, these are exactly the specific things that's going to work, you know, for a grocer, for a florist, for home improvement retail or whatever. But, as I worked with clients, as I leveraged my own uh, 20 plus years of corporate experience and, and analyzed what was going on, these seemed to consistently be themes that led to success. So the first six I call table stakes. In other words, if you're not pretty good at them, you are probably falling behind. And so I'll just tick them off quickly. That's uh, being digitally enabled, uh, being human centered being um, harmonized, uh, personalized, connected. Uh, now I'm forgetting one. <laughs> um, the last two are the ones that are really kind of the differentiating ones. Um, number seven, I call memorable, which is really the thing that lines up best with being remarkable, but it's you know, how do you create that intense customer relevancy, um, great differentiation that's sustainable, and kind of amplify the wow, find one or two, three, four things maybe that are really highly, highly uh, differentiating that customers will talk about. And then the last one I call radical, which is really developing this culture of experimentation to kind of keep creating new things over time. So talk about um, harmonize. You know, one of the concepts, I, you know, you said, talk about is that omni-channel is dead. Um, so talk a little about that essential thought, like that outline, that concept for us? Well, I sometimes joke around that there's only two things I don't like about omni-channel. It's the omni and it's the channel. And the reason <laughs> I say that, other than trying to get a cheap laugh, is I, you know, there's been this big push ever since multi-channel was a thing back in the late 90s. I headed up multi-channel integration in 1999 for a big retailer. It's not a new idea. Um, but then, you know, omni became the thing. And it was this idea of, you know, we need to be everywhere. And, you know, I think what that led to was kind of a everybody out for a pass sort of orientation. You know, we've got to be on social. We've got to be this. We've got to be that. Um, number one, you know, it's not everywhere. Like, you don't have to be in an airport shop necessarily or on a cruise ship or you know, doing pop-ups. Like, so I think this general idea from a strategy standpoint of being everywhere I think it's clearly doesn't make any sense. Uh, but what's more important is you have to pick the places to show up where it really matters. So it's not about Omni. It's about focus, uh, recognizing that, yes, the customer can be connected to us and shopping in a nanosecond because of their smart device. And then channel, um, it's not about channels. The The biggest thing that is that has set retailers back into de de that. The biggest thing that set retailers back in a digital age is their focus on channels, um, mm. you know, e-commerce versus brick and mortar. The customer does not care about channels. I've been doing this a long time. I've never heard a customer talk about channels unless they're talking about YouTube. They're, you're one brand operating across multiple price points and, and multiple touch points and channels. If you're going to say anybody is the channel, the customer is the channel. So you have to focus on the customer and get away from, you know, for the most part, get away from these channel distinctions. So the reason why I like harmonized, you know, some people call it unified or seamless. Um, I don't like those particularly either. Um, customers, I've never heard a customer say, you know, I'd like your brand better if there were fewer seams. You know, I'm like, we should, as retailers, talk like customers, not talk to ourselves. So that's a little bit of my semantic rant. But 
But Harmonize is, the reason I like it is it's this idea about orchestrating the customer experience to be a beautiful thing. So our job as retailers, I think, are figuring out what the customers want. And of course, various customers can behave differently in different circumstances. But figuring that out, then we have all these tools, technologies, techniques, et cetera, to pull on, just like an orchestra has all sorts of different instruments that serve different purposes. And depending upon what that customer is trying to do, we then need to orchestrate a, a customer experience that is harmonious, that is, is beautiful. So resolve the discordant notes or pain points, friction points, whatever you want to call them, and then amplify the wow, you know, create that crescendo, overplaying the analogy perhaps a little bit, but, you know, something that is really, really meaningful. And so I think that there's a flatness to seamless and unified and integrated. That's fine, but that's not remarkable. That's not what is going to create the loyalty with the customer. That is expected. And so if all you're doing is integrating something or unifying or eliminating the seams, that just keeps you in the game. I, I want to get retailers to think about how do you amplify that? Wow. How do you create something remarkable and harmonize and making this a harmonized, harmonized experience is, is a big part in this era, I would argue. And I think if you look at the retailers that are successful today, most of them are very, very good on this dimension, whether they call it omni-channel or whatever they call it, that doesn't matter so much. So then on the, uh, you know, the end of the, the, the last essential you mentioned, um, radical, um, sort of, to me, feels like, you, you know, you're, harm you're in harmony and now you got to obviously do something about it. So talk about that concept of radical. You know, obviously that to me seems like the one that gets, sets you apart. <laughs> well, it, it can. I mean, you know, there are some retailers and there's some segments of retail that probably don't need a ton of change right now, at least. And, you know, there are many others that do need radical change. Again, if we go back to, to, you know, the department store world or a lot of the malls, I mean, those, those businesses are slowly sinking into oblivion. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that the pace of that sinking can accelerate. I have a quote in the book, which is from um, Ernest Hemingway's Sun Also Rises, where these two characters are talking. And one said, how did you go bankrupt, Bill? And he says, slowly, or uh, gradually, then suddenly. And, you know, I think there is a point at which sometimes you can just kind of fall off, fall off a cliff. But um, so retailers, you know, if they're behind, as we talked about, say, with Macy's and others, if they're behind, they have really got to accelerate the pace of their change, as well as aim much higher in terms of the value they're delivering to customers. If you're already doing pretty well, then you need to stay on that curve. So, so being a radical is number one, being willing to think very differently about your business model. If you're just going to keep doing what you've always done, but just a little bit better, that might work uh, for a while. But I think we've seen plenty of examples where that approach basically doomed retailers or is about to doom retailers. So, so some of it is the willingness just to think kind of from a blank sheet, think much more radically, Think about how to provide more solutions rather than just products. You know, there's a number of different strategies, depending on which segment you're in, which kind of competitive um, situation you find yourself in, you might do. But a lot of it is really about building a culture of experimentation. You know, I think it's become very, very difficult in most instances just to just do a big study, like, I don't know, study the metaverse for six months and then say, aha, we have the metaverse answer. And then, ta-da, here's our metaverse strategy. And that's the thing that's got a great chance for success and will stand us in good stead for a number of years. But in a non-digital world, that sort of strategy might work because, you know, well, most things were asset intensive and took years to build and, and um, you know, you couldn't change very, very quickly. In today's world, that's a pretty hard strategy to figure out. So, so building a culture of experimentation always be testing, you know, trying a lot of stuff and then evolving through those experiments very quickly with a portfolio approach. You know, that's what I think radicals do. Um, and, and, you know, that's the essence of what, what the strategy is about. And I think you can see a lot of success from companies that have taken that approach. It's just not something that most retailers are used to even even when you know we've seen all this change and disruption for the past 15 20 years 
not that many retailers I've seen really have I seen really change their approach to to innovation. So so COVID sort of um, accelerated. There's all this, you know, we're we're guilty of it. Myself, I'm guilty of it. That it accelerated innovation, accelerated technology. Um, and so, tell me what you feel about that. Do you feel that as part of this um, these essentials that you speak about? Did COVID really accelerate innovation? Is there a technology that you feel retailers have to go after? Or is it still more of that same idea that, you know, they need to really just take a look at their entire strategy and come up with what it sounds like, just be smart and and make decisions based on what makes sense for that retailer. Talk about what happened with COVID and technology innovation. Well, one thing that didn't happen with COVID, even though it was a it was a common narrative, you know, there was this idea that we had ten years of acceleration and ten weeks or or whatever, and um, some people who should have known better didn't do their math very well because that was pretty clearly a function of what happened to the numerator and denominator and was a short lived phenomenon. So, so people who still hold on to that, and I still hear it, um, you know, they need to check their facts. What what did happen in terms of e commerce? penetration is there was a massive spike. For the most part, we have gotten back to where we expected to be. There's a few exceptions. Uh, Grocery accelerated a bit more than some other sectors. But for the most part, we are uh, on the trend that we already were on. Um, But I think there are a few other things that are worth paying attention to. One is it, it caused many retailers to pull the trigger on things that were in the works uh, or they hadn't really done anything on, uh, but they were kind of forced to. So so curbside pickup, online pickup in store, a lot of retailers that have been slow rolling that, you know, were, I guess, out of desperation forced forced to do it. Um, I hope, and I've said this many times, Almost everything that retailers were forced to do were good ideas five years ago. So it is not that COVID changed anything other than to point out problems in organizations in terms of innovation. So my hope, the lesson is that if if there are good ideas that add customer value um, to do them or to at least experiment with them earlier, because it's not like buy online, pick up in stores. New, we rolled that out um, in, places I worked at 15 years ago. So they're not new. Um, but, you know, it did expose more consumers to uh, some degree of online shopping that perhaps they might not have otherwise looked at because, you know, more out of desperation, I guess. Uh, and that's had the effect of, of accelerating digitally led shopping. It just turns out a lot of that digitally led shopping still involves physical stores. So the last thing I'd say about COVID's impact is in a lot of ways, it actually made stores more important, which is kind of counterintuitive. And, and part of the reason why I think it's counterintuitive is there's this narrative that's persisted for a while that as e-commerce grows, it's kind of a zero-sum game. That zero, e-commerce growth comes at the expense of physical stores. Now, that is sometimes true. But when we say e-commerce, that is how the product is ordered not necessarily how the demand is generated or how the product is fulfilled. And one of the things that COVID really accelerated was order online, pick up on in store, or it pushed retailers like Target, like Walmart, like many others to fulfill e-commerce orders from store stock. So it really is accelerated this blurring of the lines between physical and digital that was already happening. I write about it in my book, which I finished writing before COVID. So it wasn't COVID specific, but it really forced a more, um, a greater recognition of the blurring of the lines. And I think it forced retailers to realize, particularly retailers like Target or Walmart, that we're not going to out Amazon, Amazon. We're not going to build 200 massive distribution centers to try to do same day or next day delivery. Actually, our stores are assets if we invest in them and if we think of them as not just places for customers to go buy stuff, but kind of the hub of our ecosystem. So that's, you know, I think for a lot of people, 
that was a surprising outcome because the idea was, oh, this is really going to push so much more stuff online as if online is a separate thing. And it did a bit, but it mostly reinforced the, um, the advantages of a, of a converged strategy of uh, blur, you know, accepting the blurring of the lines between digital and physical. And so a lot of traditional retailers, you know, it's not like Target's a new retailer, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, some of, some of those retailers benefited at the same time that a lot of the brands like Wayfair, like Olbers, like Warby Parker, you know, the flaws in their business model as, as being largely online only have really been exposed. So it's really kind of funny that, you know, we've gone from retail apocalypse being, I think, now clearly nonsense to hmm, maybe it's more of a disruptor apocalypse because most of those businesses, despite the move online, actually are in worse shape. So it's very, it's one of the, it gets back to why I wrote the book. I mean, a lot of this stuff, I think people just paid attention to kind of the very top level simplistic analysis without kind of getting below the surface. Sorry, that was a very long winded answer. No, that it's well, you just reinforce that idea of harmonization, like that harmonized, you know, it's not just being one or the other, it's recognizing that they work together, you know, that you use yeah, your and it, brick and mortar store to stock your e commerce and, and, you know, vice versa. So, yeah, well, and if I can mention two other things quickly, the other thing, and I'm, I'm definitely not the first person to, to point this out, but one of the things that I believe when I first started working, you know, when e commerce was a thing at all. Uh, back in the mid to late nineties was this, the role that stores play in advertising your e-commerce business. And, you know, now there's all this discussion about cost of customer acquisition, yada, yada, yada. But I think it's been obvious that customers will go into a store to do their research and they may buy online later or just driving by your store. It's like a billboard, right? And when I was at Neiman Marcus, we did, a fair amount of analysis. Now, this is like 2007, 2008, so still pretty early days in terms of e-commerce. But what we saw very clearly in our data was that lots of customers researched online and went to the store. And lots of customers went to the store and ordered online. But even more interesting was the number of e-commerce orders that were placed in store trade areas. In other words, the customer could have gone to the store but they didn't. And then when we opened some new stores, not only did we get all you know this new revenue in the store, but our online business in that trade area went up, which now all the digitally native brands talk about. I'm like, well, I'm not surprised because we knew this in 2008. So why would it be that different? And I've talked to William Sonoma and others that have exhibited the same thing. So I think it just says that the customer thinks about retailers as a brand there are many ways to gather information and to transact and and if done right um, they are reinforcing each other and the and that you know the same customer may shop in a store one day and may order you know shop online the next day you know that i mean you you can find i'm sure extremes of people who never go to stores or people never go online but for the most part you know there is this blending that go on and you need to really understand that um you know kind of context specific to really be able to serve the customer so i know amazon now calls this um channel agnostic session aware in other words you're not caring about where the customer is ultimately going to transact but you have to be aware of where they are in that moment and what they're doing because if they're just trying to research find the best price you have to make it easy if if they're in store and they just want to ring it up, well, you better be able to do that, right? And and depending on where the customer is, what you need to do to just meet their basic needs, but to really stand out and be remarkable can be quite different and it's complicated. Um, But the worst thing is to think of them as, you know, two distinct channels that don't talk to each other. That's that's where a lot of retailers are still having trouble. Yeah, because consumers are very impatient. You know, I may or may not have ordered something in the parking lot of the store I was just shopping in right. <laughs> from that same store. So it's like we don't have the patience. We, you know, we want it when we want it. And we don't, we, like you said, we, we, as a consumer, we blurred the lines. We don't really, we're not challenged with where do we get it. If you don't have it for us and it's not available, then we move on to somewhere you, else. Right. You so. can be. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book, which I stole from from uh, the folks at Google, is this idea that we no longer go online, we live online. And, you know, it really wasn't that long ago, at least for people of a certain generation, you know, more my age, that going online was a very intentional thing that you did from your home or office, or maybe you were one of the few people that had a laptop and you could be sitting at a coffee shop. But it was something pre-smart devices that you kind of had to plan for. And if you didn't have the equipment and internet access, you know, it was a big deal. So you have to think about, oh, I'm going to go, you know, research this when I get home and get on my home computer or whatever. Well, now, you know, just about everybody in the developed world is, te- for better or worse, is tethered to a smart device 24-7. So wherever you are, you can be, you know, quote unquote, shopping. And if the if whatever it is you're trying to do with a given retailer isn't going well, whatever that looks like, what are your store hours? Do they have, have this inventory? What's the price, et cetera? You know, you're out of the game. And that's such a different customer journey than than most of us experienced, you know, even even 10 years ago. So that was a massive, massive change. And I think a lot of retailers aren't doing, I know a lot of retailers aren't doing the customer journey mapping, you know, in the level of detail they need to, to really understand where they may be falling short or, you know, more positively, where they may have an opportunity to really amplify the wow and do something more remarkable. Hmm, perfect. Um, so let's, uh, let's you know, I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions, kind of like our lightning round. Um, so yeah. give, me two, uh, give me two misconceptions that are occurring in the innovation of retail space. Like, what are those two misconceptions? Well, I'll be a bit repetitive. I think one of them is that the growth of e-commerce automatically comes at the detriment of physical stores, when in many cases it can be to the benefit of it's just different. Uh, the second one, I think, is that you know this this idea of a slightly better version of mediocre is going to be enough that you know incremental change will really move the dial. Uh, I think you have to do, in many cases, much more of a step change in delivering customer value to even get noticed by the customer, much less get them to shift their spending to your brand. Great. And uh, what is a current hot trend or technology that you think is vastly overrated and will not be as big um, as currently predicted? So something that might be overrated. Well, I think I have to go with the metaverse. Uh, it's probably too easy to pick, but I think, uh, you know, we started this year. It seemed like almost everybody I was talking to, looking at various people's predictions, uh, you know, it's all about the metaverse. And, you know, we've seen meta blow through, I think it's $15 billion at this point. And we see, you know, very few uh, customers really engaged in anything that counts as the metaverse. There's the whole issue of you know, what customers don't even know what the metaverse is. And so it's a little bit hard to get engaged with something you don't know. And most uh, companies that I'm familiar with, um, you know, there's some small experiments that are interesting and have, have moved the dial a little bit. But in aggregate, uh, it's, it's still quite early for the metaverse. Not that it won't turn out to be. Uh, significant down the road, but I think I think we're two or three years off before there's anything really worth getting excited about. So it's experimentation mode, but it, as it being a big thing, it's it's not ready yet. And what is the one technology that either no one is talking about or not talking about enough that you think will be big in the next two years? So even though you asked for one, I'm going to give you two uh, because one of them is not a technology. I, I think we're not spending enough time focused on humanity, you know, how do we use analog solutions or analog approaches to meet customers' needs? Technology is incredibly important, transformative. I'm not I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology, but there's many cases, whether it's somebody trying to reach a human being to deal with a customer service problem instead of a chat bot, that that can be extremely value added and really additive to building customer loyalty. Uh, but probably easier to get your head around is how does human interaction in a physical store? And, you know, that's still where about 90% of all retail business is driven. How does some better, you know, empathetic, 
well-trained human interaction, how can that be a game changer for, for your strategy? So I would, a piece of advice, just not automatically assume that technology is sort of the thing that's going to make the difference. But specific to, tech, to technology, I think one of the things that's also, and it's kind of related, is underappreciated is store level technology that can really drive revenue and profit. So, you know, there's lots of using AI, there's lots of um, self-checkout, that's great. I think those will continue to grow, but I think what's underappreciated is store level technology like a company I work with called Crave Retail. They have this interesting technology in fitting rooms to allow the customer to get serviced faster, to get merchandise recommendations, you know, personalized merchandise recommendations. If you get the customer to the store, which is hard enough, <laughs> to get them into the fitting room, which is hard enough to not convert more of that traffic and to not get higher average uh, dollar sales. Uh, but there's lots of opportunities. That's a specific one with fitting room. But I think in-store technology that is about converting more traffic, uh, helping the customer buy more stuff, helping them get better stuff. You know, we're not leveraging that traffic as powerfully as we could. And there's a number of technologies that are pointed at that that don't get that much attention, but oftentimes have much faster path to, to ROI than, you know, machine learning or some of these other things that are, are interesting, but, you know, don't always have as powerful a business case. Perfect. Well, Steve, um, we spoke for a long time. It was fa fascinating. I feel like a much more informed consumer. Um, <laughs> forget what I do for a living. Um, but thank you. I just wanted to thank you so much. It was a, a sure. truly a pleasure speaking with you today. I appreciate your time. Um, and for anyone interested in connecting with Steve, you can connect with him on his website at stephenpdennis.com. And please check out his book, uh, Remarkable Retail. Um, I am currently reading it. It's fantastic. So I strongly recommend thank you. it. So again, I wanted to thank you all for tuning in. Please continue to stay curious and remember to subscribe and like all of our social media posts and feeds to continue to, to hear more episodes of our podcast. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.